I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG. Welcome to Ask Dave episode 89. Our summer of antennas continues with this close look at the popular MFJ 1984 MP multiband end fed horizontal wire antenna that retails at US $59.95. Now, this antenna is one of the new breed of N-fed multiband antennas. The appeal of these antennas is high. You can hang one and not too far from your radio and then stretch the end out wherever you can get it up high. This diagram from the manual shows two possible use cases, one for home installation and the other for portable work. There's no need for a center feed line, it's end fed. The antenna covers several popular HF bands. I might point out that with lots of skepticism back in March 2016, QST reviewed a very similar antenna and was surprised to find out it worked well and was a great antenna. So I guess there are new things under the sun. And now other manufacturers are getting in on the act. Note for our MFJ antenna that often a counterpoise or an actual ground may be required at the feeding end. We'll talk more about this later. I'm going to use the antenna test range I covered in an earlier video, which consists of two 20-foot masts up about 75 feet apart in my backyard. Now, this antenna is one of a series of such antennas from MFJ. This antenna can be purchased to cover 80 meters as its lowest band or 40 meters as the lowest. Also, the antennas are available in low power versions, a medium power version, and a high power version. The one I'm testing is the 40 meter medium power version and will handle up to 300 watts momentarily. What this really means is that it's designed to go with a standard 100 watt output single sideband or CW transceiver. Note that the high power version only handles up to 800 watts of single sideband or CW. I wouldn't drive it with more than 5 or 600 watts though, and note that any of these antennas does not include full power, 100% duty cycle digital modes. You'll have to reduce power for these. Okay, let's look at what we're dealing with. The antenna comes in this yellow bag. Note that you have to download the manual from the MFJ website. The manual covers all six versions of this antenna. Let's let the antenna out of the bag. MFJ makes note that the end of the antenna, this device here, can be hooked to a rope that is thrown over a tree. With the rope, the antenna end can be pulled over the tree with the end connector smoothed so that the probability of snagging is less. Now, there's a black box at the other end. Let's take a closer look. The coax connects here. Any ground or counterpoise connects here. It's all covered with this little box. The instructions say to hang the coax straight down to keep the weather from getting inside the box. Hanging coax by the connector is an invitation for trouble. So provide some strain relief if you can. Of course, we want to see what's in the box. There are four screws holding it on. Inside, we see a large toroid. It's configured as an auto transformer, which means it's a voltage ballon. The coax is connected across only two turns. Also across the coax are these two capacitors connected in series. Each capacitor is marked 220 at 500 volts. By connecting in series, the capacitance is cut in half but the voltage divides across the two capacitors, so the voltage rating for the set of two capacitors is 1,000 volts peak. Now, 
I created a problem for myself by moving the toroid core around to photograph it. The wire at the top of the auto transformer has broken loose from its mooring. I'm pretty sure this is my fault, so I won't lay this to poor quality control. I will attach a wire here at the end, pull the wire on the toroid tight, and solder that where it needs to go. Note that the inductance is related to the number of turns, not the tightness. Tightness is important, however, to keep all the inductor parameters stable, including inter-element capacitance. Okay, having done that, we look at the transformer. Every time the wire goes through the center of the toroid, that counts as one turn. The voltage ratio is the ratio of the two turns to the total of 14 turns. Note that those first two turns count in the secondary too because it's an auto transformer. So the voltage ratio of output versus input is 14 divided by 2 or 7. Now the impedance ratio of input to output is the square of the turns ratio which is the square of 7 or 49 to 1. So assuming an input of 50 ohms the actual output impedance is 49 times that, or 2450 ohms, give or take. And this is affected somewhat by the capacitor. In short, it's a pretty high impedance. Recall that an end-fed dipole has a pretty high impedance too. Note that instead of a matching stub, as in the ZEP, which only works on one band, we're using an actual transformer style ballon, so it could work on multiple bands. The way this antenna works is that for each operating band, the actual antenna has a harmonic relationship with its electrical length. Let's look at that in this diagram. At 40 meters, we have one half wavelength for our 66 feet of antenna. At 20 meters, we have two half-wave dipoles end-to-end, -end, or an array of two dipoles, and this array will have some gain. At 15 meters, we have three half-wave dipoles arrayed in a collinear manner, so this will have some gain also. And on 10 meters, we have four half-wavelength dipoles end-to-end, -end, and this will also exhibit some gain. Note that the radiation patterns are generally broadside each side of the antenna, and the patterns will be somewhat different depending on the band. Regarding 30 meters, I don't see a harmonic relationship here. Perhaps I'm overlooking something, but I really don't think so. Well, let's get on to the testing. While the wire is nice insulated stranded wire and is easy to handle, it does take a twist and should not simply be pulled out in coils, but rather carefully unrolled. I'm attaching the coax to the box and the other end to the far pole of the antenna test range. It just takes a few minutes to pull up. It should be pulled to the point where most of the sag is taken out, but this is not hard drawn copper, so don't yank on it too much. You can sort of feel when you're pulling it too tight. This wire is nowhere near as strong as seven strand hard drawn copper. Note this also means that with time it may sag some more. If so, you can remove the sag if you want. MFJ's manual suggests that if you want to raise the center higher than the ends, that's fine too. In this case, note that I haven't pulled the antenna really tight, so the attachment of the heavier RG213 coax pulls the box down a little bit. Okay, now the testing begins. I get out my trusty MFJ 256B antenna analyzer. I'm going to write down the 2 to 1 SWR points on each band, the point with lowest SWR, and the resonant point, meaning with the lowest reactance. Okay, on 40, there is no point in the band where it has an SWR less than 2 to 1. But we won't stop there. We check 
30 meters and find no response as we pass through the band from 10.1 to 10.15 megahertz. On 20 meters, the SWR is less than 2 to 1 across the entire band. And 15 meters works out the same way as does 10. I suppose that's cool that it works well on 20, 15, and 10, but I want it to work on 42. Now, there are several things that could affect the performance of the antenna. First, the manual says if the SWR shows the antenna is off on several bands in the same direction, the total length of wire can be adjusted. But here, only 40 and 30 are cuckoo. And the manual says you need a tuner for 30 anyway. So, I don't want to mess with the length. Regarding grounding between my station single point ground and the antenna is 50 feet of RG213. The ground side of the ballon is the shield on the feed line, but it does have 50 full feet to go, so it is grounded. That leaves a counterpoise as a potential solution. Now, a counterpoise is a length of wire that gives the antenna something to, quote, work against, unquote. I know that's not a satisfactory definition, but the idea of a counterpoise is pretty hazy. Anyway, it's like standing on a boat while pushing another boat away. The boat you're standing on has some inertia, so at first you can push pretty hard, but then the pushing starts your boat moving too. The key elements of this analogy are that the uh, boat has inertia, but it also picks up movement because the accelerations are equal and opposite. Well, in an electrical sense, that sure sounds like reactance to me. In fact, both capacitance and inductance resist change. Capacitance resists the change in voltage, and inductance resists the change in current. Now, I note that a counterpoise is simply a wire, but at RF it can act as a reactive element. So how long does this wire need to be? Let's attach a 15-foot wire to the ground attachment point, as mentioned in the manual, and see what effect it has. I used some hard-drawn stranded copper wire I had on hand to create the 15-foot counterpoise. I lowered the antenna, attached the counterpoise, and hoisted the antenna. I used some rope to pull the counterpoise away from the end of the antenna so it wasn't hanging right next to the feed line. So, now, let's see what effect the counterpoise has had. I redid the SWR measurements. Sadly, the results came out the same. 20, 15, and 10 meters were in fine shape, but 40 meters still wanted to resonate on the high side of the ham band. If anything, the numbers on 40 were even worse. Okay, the next thing to do is to lengthen the counterpoise, so I added another 15 feet or so. That didn't affect 20, 15, or 10, but it did make 40 worse with enough reactance that I could barely get below 2 to 1 anywhere, and still, that wasn't in the band. So, I shortened the counterpoise to where it was 20 feet. But while that made 40 meters better, the band was still not usable. Okay, the next thing is to try slightly lengthening the antenna. I'm going to add some length with the simple two-foot jumper cable. Well, the results were equally simple. It put the upper half of the 40 meter band within the two to one pass band at the expense of throwing 20, 15, and 10 completely off kilter. MFJ sent me the build instructions so I could compare mine with the official dimensions. I looked carefully at the toroid and discovered that it met spec with two windings between the shield side of the coax and the coax center lead, with 12 further windings leading from the coax center lead to the antenna. I also measured the antenna wire specified at 66 feet, and it was within an inch or so of that. 
So absolutely everything that could be measured was measured. My solder repair touched up, all the screws tightened, and so on. I did some comparative listening on 20 meters. I heard several DX stations, including one in North Africa. I compared weak signals between my vertical, my station vertical, and the 1984 and thought that the 1984 was a bit quieter. For strong signals, the 1984 had a tiny edge over the vertical and was quieter too, but not by enough to call it an advance as much as was the 20 meter collinear that I tested in the last Ask Dave episode. So, there you have it. Stop the presses, okay? I just heard from MFJ. This is from Richard Littlefield, and he is the one that adapted the antenna for MFJ, and this is what he says. Because of the high driving resistance, feeding this antenna with longer lengths of coax can get interesting. That's an understatement. With 60 feet of wire in the radiator and 50 feet of coax, potentially in common mode, the radiator might actually be approaching something that looks like a center-fed full-wave dipole, which is, I agree, not good from a matching point of view. Uh, I'm not sure how it is mounted, but if you have an analyzer and the feed point is down near the ground, I would try testing it on 40 with just a very short length of coax and perhaps a 10-foot counterpoise laid out on the ground. That is, I did eliminate the variable of the 50-foot coax. So I took the coax off, it's rolled up over there. It says that chain should bring you into the ballpark. Then if the antenna responds when set up that way, you can work on finding a feed line length laid along the ground that won't be so reactive. If the feed length of the antenna is not down close to the ground, in other words, less than six or eight feet, it's right on the ground there, um, it probably should be. I've read that the impedance of the ground reference at the cold end of the matching transformer doesn't need to be especially low, unlike a quarter wave vertical that may require a radial field, because the driving resistance of the radiator is extremely high by comparison. However, a ground reference of some sort needs to be present at the matching transformer or the network can't do its job properly. As for 30 meters, these antennas seem to resonate high in frequency on that band, somewhere around 10.7 megahertz, as I recall, so you'll likely need a tuner no matter what. Thanks for reviewing it. I can't take credit for the design. It's one that's been floating around uh, Europe for some time, but I did do MFJ's implementation and wrote the manual, and that is from Rick K1BQT. All right, are we ready? I have taken the taken the thing down. Uh, the far end there is still up in the air. And here's what I've got. I've got the box on the ground, six feet of coax, a 10-foot counterpoise, and let's see what we get. Okay. Um, at 11 megahertz, going down to 10 to 9, no response. Okay, let's go down to 7 megahertz. Oh, well, look at that. Okay, it is 1.0 at 70556. That's with the box on the ground. Now, if I lift this up, like this, the SWR goes 3, uh, 3.5 to 1, okay? I'm just setting that box down on the ground, just setting it on the ground. The other end is up 20 feet, not a lot of tension on it, okay? So the box being fed by the coax is on the ground, and we're getting, uh, Let's see, 1.0 at 7 megahertz. Let's see what it goes up to at uh, 7, 2, 5, 7, 2, 3. It's 2.2. If I pull this up, 
it just let's try this at 7.3 Um, 2.0 okay it, it, this is very strange <laughs> that you would feed an antenna on the ground it's not something I've ever heard of um, let's just check 20 see if we've screwed something up okay oh no go on 20 at 14.070 oh, it's 2.4 when you get to 14.35, it's 3.3. .3. Let me pull that box off the ground and let's see what we get. Okay, now that's much better. At 14, I have 1.2. At uh, 14.35, well, it depends on how much I pull on this. If I pull on it this much, it's... Uh, at the top of the band, 1.7. If I put the thing on the ground, it's 3.0. Go figure. Okay, let's try this for uh, 21. Oops, not doing real good there. Let's pull it up. By the way, this is not good on coax connectors. No, I pushed a button, shouldn't have done that. Okay. 21 to 21.45 as excellent. But if I put the box back down on the ground, it's not so good. Um, uh, just not so good. 28, let's go to 28. Okay, with the box on the ground, no good. The box is a little bit in the air. You get some response less than 2 to 1, but the lowest is uh, 1.7 to 1. Okay, well, what on earth does this mean? You have to position the antenna differently uh, depending on what you're going to do with this. This completely changes the use case for this particular antenna. Short coax, 10 foot uh, counterpoise, and with the uh, box sitting on the ground for 40 meters, I mean literally on the ground, and then the wire slopes up to about 20 feet and we get the thing working on 40 meters. This is not a home antenna at all. It's just not. You can use it for 40 and so on, but you know, the way my, uh, the way I'm set up right over there is my ground, my station ground, and the cable comes from there. This is not station grounded. It's sitting out here with just a counterpoise. So the use case for this would be uh, portable. You're in a park, you're throwing up one end of the antenna over a tree, you mess with where to put the box until you get the lowest SWR, and then you go ahead and, and do your thing. I would worry that much of the signal would be absorbed by the ground, but uh, you know, with a portable antenna, as long as you get the right end there, can get the SWR down, you might be able to do things with the other end of the antenna. So where does that leave us? I think it leaves us right back where we started. It's a great antenna um, for uh, 20, 15, and 10. Uh, when put in the air in conventional fashion, it's not very good on 40. However, in a very unconventional fashion, six feet of coax, a counterpoise uh, not connected to my station ground and with another end up in the air yeah you, you can make the thing tuned so where does that leave us um, we've discovered a new use case uh, but uh, it will require that you move the box around when you switch between bands so there you are
So let's go back to the uh, previously scheduled program and, and wrap up. So if you have a buddy who enjoys his or hers, by all means go ahead. They're available wherever MFJ products are sold, including by mail order from MFJ itself. I again thank you for watching. I try to cover topics that you suggest, either through YouTube comments, comments on my website, or via Ask Dave. I can't cover everything, but that doesn't stop me from trying. Please share, please click like, and please subscribe so that YouTube knows this is a channel worth recommending to others. Take a look at the tip jar. The new microphone I'm using was purchased with tips. Also, take a look at the Patreon page at patreon.com slash ke0og, which allows you to make a monthly tip. And I just made a fresh batch of thumb drives with the amateur extra videos on them, which are available on my website. So, lots of stuff going on. As always, uh, as I always do at the end of each video, here's some personal advice I've always found helpful. Use both feet when walking. Until we next meet, 73.